So, hello, it is uh, two o'clock and uh, we start our session on uh, accompanying the green and digital transition. I would like to welcome you all in this uh, session that will last two hours. I'm Anastasia Fezzi, I am an uh, expert in ETF and uh, I'm very glad to uh, moderate this uh, session uh, today. So before we start uh, with anything more, I would like to ask my colleague Chiara to explain to us uh, uh, how we will communicate digitally, some rules of the game for our digital communication. Okay, so Chiara, can you explain to us? Sure, thank you very much, Anastasia. I'm happy to remind uh, some futures about uh, our Zoom platform where we are uh, today. Uh, the first uh, rule is uh, microphone off if you are not speaking and the camera on whenever possible because we would love to see all of you on the screen with us uh, today. Um, our meeting uh, will have interpretation, so you can choose uh, the, interpretation, the interpretation channel um, uh, of the language in which you would like to follow our session today, and you can choose uh, between uh, English, French, uh, Russian and uh, uh, Arabic. Uh, we would love to interact with you as much as possible today. So please use the chat to leave your questions and uh, your comments. And uh, there will be moments uh, for all of us to share ideas and uh, exchange. In case of any technical hiccups, please just let us know in the chat and we will do our best to, to help you out in solve the, the issues. Last point, um, as uh, um, we are live uh, today also on uh, the website of uh, the International Conference Week. Um, enjoy our session and now I give back the floor to Anastasia. Anastasia Thank you, to you for explaining to us uh, these basic rules of uh, digital communication. So I would like uh, just uh, to, to say a couple of words uh, about this uh, session uh, that we, um, we are in today. So uh, as you know, uh, all of you, we have this uh, international conference, uh, Building Lifelong Learning Systems uh, for Inclusive and Green Societies in the Digital Era. It is a, a conference that lasts for one week. The previous three days, we had thematic sessions uh, with practitioners, researchers, uh, experts, uh, um, just to, uh, to capture experience of countries on how they proceed with reforms of their education and training systems and how they adapt them to the uh, raising uh, needs of uh, our new realities and, uh, and future perspectives for development in our societies and economies. Today, this morning, we started our high-level event and the purpose of this uh, uh, specific high-level event it is exactly to speak with policymakers and see what this experience of countries is telling us and uh, what are the next steps uh, to move together through international cooperation to ensure that all countries are making progress in developing lifelong learning systems that uh, will support their citizens, uh, their communities and companies uh, um, and societies overall to move forward. <clears throat> now, this afternoon, we have three parallel sessions. One is the one we are accompanying the green and digital transition. And our entry point to the discussion, it is to see how changes in economies and societies uh, uh, create skilling requirements. What are the skilling requirements and what we can do about them? There is another parallel session focusing on the issue of inclusiveness and access, taking the perspective of individual. And there is a third parallel session that is moving uh, at the same time, like uh, we speak, uh, and it is about resourcing lifelong learning systems. Yeah? And there the focus will be mainly on capacities of systems and funding. Why am I telling you all this? Because when we speak about lifelong learning systems, there are so many entry points in the discussion. And sometimes the discussion is very much fragmented. So what we are trying to do with this conference it is exactly to put all these pieces together, to have our entry points and see the different angles of the issues, to see exactly how we develop systems, lifelong learning systems, rather than having ad hoc approaches from the side of education, from the side of the economy, from the side of pedagogies, for example. Uh, 
uh, or social, social policies. So this is the whole logic of the three sessions. Obviously, there are things that are common for every discussion and that there are intersections. What specifically we will speak in this session? What are the three key questions that we are trying to answer? The first one, it is what are the implications of the green and digital transition for skills? I mean, greening and the digitalization of economies is the key driving forces, not the only, but the key driving forces for, for the future. The second question is how can we reinforce lifelong learning to support the skilling requirements of this twin transition? And the third one, it is about the policy priorities. What are the policy priorities to accelerate the desired change? So the way we will structure our discussion is in two panels, uh, and that we will deep dive into the, the skilling challenge. One is to analyze it. The second one is more on policy proposals. And uh, this is what we are going to do. Now, I would like to say that we have my colleague, Maria Lvova, who is, uh, <laughs> is our chat moderator. So she will bring to, to all of you, <laughs> less to me, but to you mainly, to our speakers, um, will bring us the questions that our participants will have. Yeah? And um, we would like really to have a, a, a lot of uh, interaction. If, uh, so just use your chat, any idea that comes into your mind or question, put it there. Nobody will say anything if it is not uh, formulated in perfect English, just be spontaneous. We all learn. We are all a little bit, you know, trying to find our way through. So be, feel free. Uh, so this is about our chat uh, uh, moderation. Before passing to our first panel discussion, I would like to invite my colleague, Ivona Ganko, our labor market expert, uh, who would like to bring to you, to speakers and participants, some key messages that came from the discussions of the thematic sessions the previous three days. Yeah. So what these people that before us discussed, yeah, what did they tell us? So some key messages. They are not exhaustive. They're not all messages, but there are some key messages. And I hope that these key messages will also inspire our further discussion. So, Ivona, the floor is yours. Please tell us what are the key messages from the previous days? Thank you. Thank you very much, Anastasia. Uh, what I need to say is that I got a very, very difficult task because uh, we uh, got uh, such an enormous, really great input from our guests, speakers and participants, very valuable insights, many proposals. Just let me recall that uh, we had uh, six uh, thematic sessions over three days discussing a number of questions, uh, like, for example, what skills do we need to uh, cope with manage and actively direct the change? How can the education and training system support the development of those new skill sets? How to make the system inclusive? How to make learning a positive experience? How to capture and measure the developments and how education and training system can adopt greening? And then who and how actually should be involved in the system change. So the scope is a really very broad. Uh, let me just summarize a few key points of the discussions. What we discussed uh, is that while all the countries and societies are affected by global trends, the nature and intensity differs of the impact. And in the world of work in particular, the digitalization, automation, artificial intelligence are replacing, displacing, reshaping and complementing many jobs. And we do not know the exact impact of those trends uh, because some jobs uh, will disappear and new jobs will be created. But the nature of work and employment relations um, are bringing new business models, new work patterns. And then climate change requires really a very strong push towards the greening of the economies. So uh, what uh, is certain is the change has accelerated strongly, and in particular with the strong impact of pandemic. And those developments obviously have very strong impact on the skill sets that people need and the people would need in the future. Uh, 
So digital and green transition create new disruptions, but at the same time, great new opportunities for us. Therefore, what we also discussed is that any policy, policy direction would need to ensure positive impact of the transition, putting people at the center. Because people's skills continue to be the best asset to catch opportunities. But skills are not static and need to be updated and fine-tuned at all stages of our lives. And to keep with pace of change means that we need to upskill, reskill, train, retrain what makes us lifelong learners throughout our lives. And adapting and directing the change also demands new business management and skills resilience. It also requires a dynamic combination of competences. New jobs in a low carbon economy will require heterogeneous skills portfolio, most probably, and the wider skill sets with multidisciplinary profiles. So new technical and transversal skills will need to be complemented by key competences, but also very much, and that was very strongly underlined by socio-emotional skills. And uh, we need to bring back humanity to the world of work and to classrooms and to our society as a whole. And what is new and very interesting that we heard is that personal and business reinventing ability will soon become a key asset. And of course, environmental and sustainability awareness as producers and the consumers will be much, much more important. And what is also clear is that uh, more work needs to be done to ensure transparency of skills, uh, but also to change perceptions about skills. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, we need a new forward-looking understanding of the skills uh, needs, and while big companies almost fully embark on digital and green transformation. Smaller enterprises have it difficult, but SMEs and even micro enterprises are the majority in our partner countries and uh, in uh, developing countries in uh, general. So they really find it difficult to, the, to identify the skills needs uh, uh, of uh, uh, their companies and they also uh, have difficulties to uh, find the related opportunities but also to identify uh, risks. Uh, but uh, certainly there is already a shift uh, in the industry uh, for much, much, much more green requirements and uh, much more uh, green demands. Uh, what uh, is also uh, visible is that uh, uh, the skills uh, need to be uh, much more transparent, but also the skills that are available uh, on the market. So skills acquired uh, on the job in a non-formal or informal setting need to be put at the disposal of employers. And for this, we would need to a system of identifying, recognizing, validating, and documenting uh, those skills available. So uh, policies would need to guide and uh, support skills development as a part of a green and digital transformation. Uh, but also what was very much underlined, the policies would need to ensure social fairness, inclusiveness and non-discrimination. And for this, uh, we would need to bring, as I said, humanity to our uh, societies, work and classrooms. And people need to be empowered to discover, develop and invest in their potential. Career guidance and counseling uh, will uh, very much help in that, identifying interests and aptitudes, which together bring a real potential of people. So, summing up, for the digital and green transition to be successful, there is a need for forward-looking vision, but also progressive implementation of the system change. And this we can do through innovative practices, collaborating among multiple actors, very often new actors appearing in a lifelong learning system. And we need to cooperate towards a common goal 
and build lifelong learning ecosystem that would embed skills development in a broader economic and social development objectives. So how to accompany the green and digital transition? Uh, let's discuss it now. Thank you very much and over to ETF Studio. Oh, no. Thank you very much, Yvonne. I think that we all agree with what was just said. Yeah, we all know that uh, labor markets are changing, workplaces are changing. I mean, we all know these things. Yeah, we would all agree. Yeah. And now uh, there are two things that I would like to highlight from my part. Um, one of the main things that came out from the previous discussions is that we all have to become learners. Yeah. Poor us. We have to become learners and to develop technical skills and key competencies and citizenship skills and uh, adapting to new realities. That is fine. The second thing it is how we can be practical to move ahead with all these ideas for which we all agree. Okay, and this is what we will discuss in our two panel discussions. Before going to the panel discussion, which will unpack many of the things that uh, Ivona uh, mentioned before, we would like to test a little bit the ground on a very practical issue using Mentimeter. We have two questions to ask speakers and participants of this session. And uh, uh, these questions are, are really very simple, but we would like to see how you think about it. Who will launch the Mentimeter? We will launch it. Let's launch the Mentimeter. We are ready. Yes. Uh, you will find the link to participate to the poll in the chat together with the translation of the questions and the possible answers. So now we want really to hear from you. Uh, have your opinion on this. And the question is, uh, will the green and digital transition create more employment? What do you think? Yes, no, possibly. Just uh, click on the link, uh, open uh, the vote, and provide us your uh, your answers. We are really curious to know what do you think about it. We give you a bit more of time just to go on the chat, uh, open the link, and provide uh, your answers. And I see that some results uh, are already coming. I'm very so, curious to see what the bet is. Most of us say yes. Some are more uh, the possibly, and uh, only few people think that uh, no, they don't to, to create uh, more employment. I think that now the yes is growing, so I think it's a really a good sign for our session, first of all. Anastasia, would you like to comment the result? No, I mean, I, I mean, it's very positive to have uh, some conviction that uh, it will create more employment and uh, a doubt that uh, possibly it's a hope. It's, it's not a the hope. certainty, it's a Indeed. hope. Okay, so yeah. I think that we can pass then to yes, the yes. next um, question, which is, will the green and digital transition create better jobs? As before, just uh, go to the link and provide your uh, your question, your answers. Sorry <laughs> to these questions. Will the green and digital transition create better jobs? Yes, no, possibly. As before, just some seconds to you to to vote. Ah, oh. I think that we have a little technical hiccup. It seems that Mentimeter is doesn't work at the moment. Maybe we can just try to close it and reopen it just to give the chance to our participants to provide their opinion. Everything is blocked. Maybe we can do it. Uh, we after. can do it later. I let's, think so. Let's pass to our panel because uh, yes, uh, we will hear about these things. Absolutely. Over okay. to you, Anastasia. So thank you. Let's continue uh, now. We are passing to our first panel discussion, and the topic is uh, what the green and digital transition brings us uh, and what are the implications on skills. Our panelists are uh, Olga Striesca Ilina, uh, Senior Skills and Employability Specialist in uh, ILO. Hello, Olga. Ms. Tatiana Babrauskine, 
uh, from the European Economic and Social Committee and head of the International Relations Unit of the Lithuanian Education Science Trade Union. And Ms. Tamar Aladashvili, Director of the Environment, Information and Education Center in Georgia. So thank you very much for being with us. And uh, um, I would like to start uh, with a question to Olga, because uh, Olga, you have done a lot of research in ILO at international level on what are the implications exactly of this uh, uh, digital and uh, uh, green transition on employment, uh, on uh, skills and jobs. Yeah. So um, we would very much appreciate if you bring us the, the results of this work uh, uh, by telling us what, what are the global trends, yeah? What are the, the global trends we see developing in terms of job creation? What are the risks and opportunities for employment? And uh, how skills can benefit people, but also communities and businesses? Three questions. So all together, <laughs> tell us what you, you have seen through your research coming up as results to this, as answers, possible answers to this question. To you, Olga. Thank you, Anastasia, and uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I think it's an excellent opportunity to share some of thoughts and uh, also some of findings. And also, it was an excellent idea, Anastasia, actually, to put together the green and digital transition into one discussion. Because indeed, uh, I think the answer is contained a little bit in your question. Uh, when you say whether there are uh, trends that defi define the digital and green transition similar in terms of uh, job creation and destruction dynamics. And indeed they are. They are maybe even, you know, sometimes for different reasons, but eventually, you know, it, 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 as it has been already mentioned through, um, uh, through the conclusions of previous discussions, uh, it is really, a, a commonly known fact that there, there will be some jobs created, some jobs destroyed, and uh, this is the, the dynamic which we call in the ILO creative destruction of jobs. Uh, a creative destruction because overall uh, we estimate the, the employment impact will be positive, so that's basically the answer to the first question which was put in, in, the, in the Mentimeter. Uh, however, you know, things, many things do not happen by default. Of course, you know, uh, it may be possible that in the short run, uh, the uh, employment creation dynamic might be actually negative. Um, much depends on the policies as they are implemented. Um, and therefore, we shouldn't really leave it to just the market to, to resolve uh, policies do matter a lot, in, not only in, in, in terms of employment creation, but also in terms of the second question, which was put on the Mentimeter in terms of the quality of jobs, as well as access to uh, training that may potentially uh, allow people to get to those jobs. It's also a question of equality. Um, you know, in terms of the discussion of, of the trends under the, the digital transition, you all saw the, uh, the multiple publications in the media uh, based on uh, basically done, uh, one estimate which was produced some years ago by um, um, the academic researchers from, from the Oxford University. Uh, so the, the famous research by uh, Osborne and Frey that estimated that around 47% of uh, employment might be substituted by technology, by robots, by robotization. Uh, and they estimated that particularly for the US labor market. But in fact, that estimate was based by uh, a mere calculation of those um, portions of, of, of occupations that, that, that are uh, replaceable. So the, the routine type of tasks in the occupations. Uh, however, they never really said that this will happen. They said there is a susceptibility to, to the replacement. Uh, and the later calculations in which actually I believe much more uh, rather identify between 10 and 20% of the real replacement of, of jobs. And even in more recent research, we speak actually about replacement of tasks rather than, than jobs altogether. 
because the artificial intelligence and digitalization, they all influence uh, employment in uh, three ways. Well, one is substitution. It's really substituting the tasks by technology. Another one is uh, a complementarity kind of you know, in task and when we, we augment what we do, uh, the tasks and therefore also we have to augment the skills to handle those tasks by technology. That means that the major role is remained with, uh, with a human, but technology helps to perform that job. And then some tasks actually get expanding, which is, which is also interesting because uh, by substituting some of routine tasks, human, uh, humans tend to um, play roles in more complex tasks that potentially also include uh, some, some hybrid types of, of tasks, multitasking or complexity uh, that is not easy to handle by algorithms, uh, even with learning machines. Uh, or switching to those tax, tasks which are really very specific for humans, human type of tasks that, which are not replaceable by, by machines, uh, at least for now. Um, and overall, we know that from the past experiences uh, of technological revolutions, we know that technological unemployment is usually a temporary phenomenon. And uh, uh, overall, in the long run, the impact is positive. Uh, now, when we did the calculations uh, in the projection for the green transition uh, produced in 2019, so before the, the COVID-19 uh, and related labor market crisis, um, we calculated that in, in two scenarios, one scenario transition to renewable energies and another to circular economy. So in two scenarios, cumulatively, globally, potentially, by 2030, we have an opportunity of creating over 100 million jobs. This is a wonderful news, right? Uh, and this is all thanks to the recent you know, policy developments with the Paris Agreement and countries' commitments through nationally determined contributions, and also um, the uh, sustainable development agenda that all contains elements of climate change and sustainability throughout different uh, goals, sustainable development goals. Uh, so now, in these two transitions, if 100 million jobs created, which is wonderful news, there is also bad news because uh, there might be close to 80 million jobs destroyed. To be, in particular, to be precise, actually 78 million. Out of these 78 million, we know that around two thirds will find employment in the same occupation in the same country. They just need very light upskilling or reskilling to a new industry, which will be growing uh, through uh, the measures implemented through the green transition. Very light reskilling, maybe no reskilling at all. So they will be able to transit to new jobs. So it's only one third of those people who will actually need some serious requalification because there will be enough jobs created for everybody. I would like to underline that. Enough jobs created, created for everybody. If we manage to requalify one third of those people under risk of losing those jobs. We don't have to lose any job. We can just create 100 million jobs or more and everybody can benefit from that. Yeah, so this is important. So overall also for the green transition in the short term, there might be negative um, employment effects, but if we manage the transition well, overall the employment effect will be positive. Why is it? Because we'll calculate not only direct jobs created, but we also calculate indirect jobs created and induced jobs. So those jo jobs which are created out of reinvestment of profits of people as well as, as businesses and reinvestment also of time. This is an important element, especially when we speak about technological transition, because technological transition allows us to save a lot of time. So imagine now, for example, no, I live in France, and in France now, the government has this um, uh, major subsidies to in, uh, for retrofitting of households, and also so this is all insulation to make sure that we're climate proof, and also subsidies for the installation of some renewable energy solutions. Uh, so with this policy alone, imagine if there will be some significant number of uh, um, 
PV panels, uh, solar panels installed uh, in households. So these are not only jobs of installers, these are also jobs for those people who uh, produce the panels. These are jobs for those who will maintain them. And imagine the role of a, of a, of a plumber who comes, comes to the house and uh, such a plumber, he needs to understand all these systems and be able also to advise the customers on a solution. So this is the point which I would like to make. And this is very important. No matter how many jobs will be destroyed or created, the major challenge is to reskill people to those jobs which will be changing. And this will be more than half of, of, of jobs altogether. Now, if we calculate the substitution element plus around one third of you know, changing the, the, the tasks as technology is implemented or as the green transition goes uh, in the, into the implementation of these measures. So that is important to reskill the plumber who would be able to come to your house and provide you a proficient advice. Uh, now, just maybe one word before we move on, on the role of the COVID-19, because it really was a major disrupt on the labor market. We calculated that for 2020 alone, it affected um, close to 9% of working hours, which translated into 114 full-time jobs globally destroyed only in 2020. What is worrying, however, that again, two thirds of those jobs go into inactivity, one third in the unemployment, but two thirds in inactivity. That means that two thirds of those people completely withdraw from the labor market and they risk to the skill. So when the economy is revitalizing eventually, we might have a problem to get access to those skills people might not really come back to the labor market. And also they don't have access to uh, maintaining uh, those uh, skills. The COVID-19 accelerated some of digitalization. It, and, uh, it has been a disrupt on the labor market, but it intensified some of the uh, trends which were there before in terms of digitalization. Now, in terms of the recovery, we know that many countries are introducing recovery packages that include green transition. So the COVID-19 eventually will also intensify the green transition. We we'll very much hope it will be the case. Therefore, skills development become a major, major point. If we would like to achieve that positive effect in the longer run, it's a major enabler. It's an enabler for businesses, for productivity, for competitiveness. But skills development is also potentially a buffer if we would like to avoid that short-term negative consequences for the society and the economy. Therefore, you know, there should be some reskilling and upskilling provided for people from different backgrounds, low-skilled people from poor household, gender balanced, young people as well, women. Um, because skills development then eventually play a role of a level playing field. And this is a very important point. Therefore, it's not, again, not by default, but we need a policy which targets specific, specific groups to make sure that they have access to the skills and the jobs. And in terms of the skills themselves, you know, it's, um, uh, it's always, the success is always in the combination of different types of skills. It's technical skills plus core soft skills, uh, but it's also some uh, transferable skills, which may be technical or maybe soft skills. They are transferable from job to job. And this is important to take into account in the design of uh, training provision by vocational education and training. Also learning to learn, Anastasia, what, has, uh, what you have already mentioned, is, uh, is of course uh, is a key uh, soft skill which would apply across different occupations, but it's also important from the point of view of fundamental skills, basic skills, literacy, numeracy, literacy, digital literacy, environmental literacy, because this is all the foundation for the potential lifelong learning. Thank you. I hope well, I didn't I, much I think <laughs> I think it was very interesting what I retained, frankly speaking, from from I mean many things. But I think one uh, thing you said uh, I thought it was really important that things do not happen by default. We can we can really create uh, many jobs and better jobs, but we need also uh, drive and policies for that. Uh, 
And the other thing it is the emphasis that you put on training and reskilling, yeah? Uh, that things will not happen if we don't have people who have the right skills to take the jobs that will come up, but also to, also to create a positive transformative change. And the last point in, in relation to, to, to training and the reskilling from uh, what I get from you, it was mainly this uh, activation of people who are losing jobs now uh, with, uh, with the COVID uh, crisis, not to lose them from the labor market, not to lose them from active participation in uh, um, income generation activities in productive activities. I mean, that, there were cases in the past where we saw really people dropping out from the labor market, developing all these problems, you know, uh, not only from a labor market perspective, but also from a social perspective, and we have to avoid this. And, um, and of course, this green transition that we hope will be a new development model, at least this is what we are saying in Europe, that the Green Deal is really a new growth model based uh, uh, on environmental uh, positive uh, impact, uh, but also on, on, on fairness. And I would like uh, to pass now to Tatiana, because Tatiana, you have been the rapporteur of the opinion of the European uh, Economic and Social Committee towards an EU strategy for enhancing green skills and competences for all. There is another opinion that just appeared of the European Economic and Social Committee on adult training. Mm -hmm. So we would really like to hear from you, uh, what are these green skills and competencies? Also, Olga mentioned that before, Ivona said, said with green skills, green competence. Green. What is this all about? I mean, if we can just uh, have a little bit of uh, the mystification of this uh, term, uh, but also if you can give us some perspective in, in terms of needs in adult training to develop these new skills, are green or another color. So the floor to you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. And thank you for inviting uh, to this event. It's really, uh, uh, I was interested, actually, it was interesting to listen to uh, also speakers uh, today. I uh, spent uh, all the morning listening to them. So I really uh, got a lot of, of uh, ideas on uh, not only what is happening in the EU, but also outside the European Union. Uh, and it's really uh, something uh, which we should know and should understand that we are not living that in the European Union bubble. And uh, what struck me actually uh, uh, is that also uh, the key messages uh, are, uh, which were just presented, that we are used to thinking about green and digital transition also in the future terms, uh, speculating how green and technological developments will affect us, how um, what could be the possible solutions <laughs> and policy actions to address them. It's actually our panel about, about this. However, if we spend too much time trying to figure out uh, what we need to do in the future, we risk not to seeing that climate changes and technologi technologies have already started transforming our daily lives, our jobs, the way how we are actually uh, live and how we work. And uh, I think that this is kind of should be a kind of a wake up call uh, for all of us. And uh, uh, those policymakers, researchers, uh, they have um, to make it uh, kind of uh, understandable for the wider public. We have to bring down the sky to the S. And um, uh, if, for example, uh, we're thinking about where we can find some kind of policy on, uh, uh, on the, this transition period and we take uh, the first document which comes to our mind, uh, which, which would, would be Horizon Europe, for example, work program, uh, 21, 22, and we see 440 pages. Who is going to read that? Only experts. Who is able to interpret uh, data, figures, uh, tables? Uh, I read a lot of research on the experts. So uh, it lo looks like, like experts understand each other, policymakers understand each other, and the wider public, uh, they're not aware about what's, what's going on. Therefore, uh, I myself uh, was curious what's happening on why this, uh, let's say, um, civil society level, 
where there are many organizations, including uh, trade unions and employees organizations uh, live their own life while um, policy level is, is, is kind of, uh, uh, there's a huge gap, there is no bridge. And we as the European Economic and Social Committee are here to make this bridge uh, because we represent uh, civil society organizations, we represent unions, we represent employers organizations from all EU member states. And uh, uh, when it comes to green transition, uh, um, the acknowledgement of the need of uh, EU coordinated action uh, in education was among the educators, uh, it was among teachers, it was among uh, trainers in vocational education and training long ago. If we see how many projects were developed, how many initiatives were there, so uh, we see that a lot is happening, and how we can harvest that, how we can uh, uh, really support support this uh, kind of European level strategy, and therefore two years ago I suggested this own initiative opinion towards a new strategy for enhancing green skills and competencies for all, and uh, at that time uh, we emphasized it from the. European Economic and Social Committee that environmental responsibility is an obligation for everyone, of everyone. And um, sustainable uh, environmental development requires a drastic social change, including individual and collective changes in our mentality, behavior, lifestyles, as well as in the social, political, economic organization of our countries and societies. So the holistic perspective is usually uh, this perspective of, of holistic view. When you, we see small elements and we see the whole picture is absent and uh, uh, we see just this fragmented efforts to, to uh, tackle the environmental, also technological change, challenges. And the European Commission now uh, uh, has opened, uh, just this uh, few weeks ago, opened an uh, open pub uh, public consultation uh, to fit into a proposal for a council recommendation on education for environmental responsibility later this year. So later this year, two years after the European Economic and Social proposed that, the committee proposed that, and after, of course, national many national initiatives were taking place the commission finally stepped into this and uh, we hope that we will have the council recommendation on education for environmental sustainability and the good question was when you say what is this green skills when i was drafting this opinion that was my, my many of my colleagues said again what is this green skills is it something we we have or we don't have i say this is this is actually very co complex because if we speak about specific professional needed for your uh, work skills. This is something different. But if we speak green skills in your life, it's about everything. It's understanding that how not to waste water, how, uh, how actually uh, uh, save food, how uh, see holistically, uh, uh, how live, live with nature in peace, how to, uh, I mean, there are many, many, many elements. Some of us naturally have it. Some of us develop that. Some are not aware about many things. For instance, uh, uh, still uh, people are confused which plastic is recyclable and, and which plastic is not recyclable. This is something we can learn. And uh, uh, why, uh, why we need, uh, uh, as I already mentioned, to harvest what's happening at national level, what's happening in education sector, what's happening in the labor market. I think that uh, this is important uh, to base the strategy on exactly the practices, not just their, uh, uh, um, their kind of now, uh, this consultation, I hope it will, will be part of this kind of research, but real research is needed. And uh, then we probably can see uh, how to integrate climate aware change awareness, environmental responsibility, sustainable development, um, uh, into curricula, how we can integrate that uh, also at, very, at every workplace, how we can um, actually change uh, people's mindsets and, uh, and uh, make it kind of uh, return to what humans used to be uh, a long time ago, part of nature. Uh, 
unfortunately, it's not because I'm just trade union, unionist. Uh, we are now focused too much on the growth. Uh, we compare GDP growth, and uh, we believe that this is the criteria which shows uh, uh, stability of the country. That's not at all. That's not the criteria. That's not the indicator of stability of the country. So what if we cut the forests and show that we sell the, the, the wood and, 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 and uh, I don't know, uh, uh, created something out destroying and, uh, uh, the nature. So it's not, it's not the itself or uh, the indicator of a good, uh, economy or good social policy. So, uh, Therefore, I think uh, it's, it's maybe I partly that's a little bit chaotic because I was trying to, to reflect on what I, I've heard and what the, uh, the emphasis was put by previous speakers today. I was happy to hear that teachers and trainers were also uh, the, their importance was addressed by the speakers because who, if not teachers and not trainers, who themselves are supported by initial quality initial education and training? Uh, quality continuous professional development, who, if not them, are the key actors to introduce these changes? Because we can write everything on the paper, because paper is patient, as we say. In Lithuania, we have the saying that the paper is uh, very patient, so you can put it whatever you want. But people are not really patient, and we see youth uh, uh, movements, People, young people are already not patient anymore. They ask politicians for concrete actions, and uh, this one of this this action would be a development development of green skills, green attitudes, green knowledge, green understanding, name it, uh, and main mainly adults. That's why my opinion now on the request of the Slovenian uh, presidency about uh, adult education also uh, puts uh, one of the recommendations, because there are 18 recommendations, uh, one of the recommendations is also to uh, focus on the green skills for adults and uh, on sust uh, environmental sustainability. So that's shortly, I hope it's just the first question, <laughs> I will have the opportunity to contribute. <laughs> yeah, we do. Mike. Ah, the mic. Okay. <laughs> no, thank you, Tatiana, for this uh, reflection. I, I think that the issue of uh, uh, skilling the green transition in particular, uh, it is quite broad as it covers uh, different uh, aspects uh, from changing mindsets to having the technical skills uh, to apply uh, greener uh, technologies. Uh, to being proactive as citizen, to be able to keep companies accountable for what they are doing. Because very often we put the discussion exactly on individual behaviors and lifestyles, which is fine, but the big polluters are the companies. So their own production mo modes have to change. So just to say that we have yesterday, in fact, this session on, on green in particular, and it was all this whole broad of changing mindsets, developing right skills, and innovative approaches. Innovative approaches to use resources, even if it is human brains and innovation, to be able to shift into more sustainable production models. And there, really, there is a lot of effort to be done for young people. We had a survey with UNICEF in which uh, um, in 8,000 young people in the Europe and Central Asia region they are all very much convinced about the importance of greening in the future. They think their government, 85, I think, percent that their government does very little. They would like to act with young people, but they don't know exactly how. Because it's one thing to be an activist, it's another thing to be able to take decisions and proceed into action to make things change and happen. So let's hope that this fragmented discussion, fragmented discussions that you made before uh, finds uh, some way to get structured uh, and move uh, forward. But now what we are doing, uh, it is we will pass at a very real case from Georgia. I would like just uh, to uh, inform uh, the participants, if you don't know already, of course, uh, that Georgia is the country that hosted the world's first intergovernmental conference on environmental education in 1977. 
And from there, we have the Tbilisi Declaration and subsequent uh, conferences that are taking place exactly on environmental education. So uh, Tamara uh, Aladashvili is the director of uh, the Center for uh, Environmental uh, Information, Education Information in Georgia. This is an institution that in fact uh, reports to both Ministry of uh, uh, Environmental Protection and Education, if I'm not wrong, uh, Tamar, but you will tell us afterwards. And they are doing a lot of things uh, in order to support uh, environmental uh, education among citizens. Um, so it's really a broad range of them. So I would kindly ask uh, Tamar to tell us what you are doing. What are the, 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 the people whom you target? Yeah, And what are the actions you are implementing? Uh, thank you very much for the floor. Uh, good afternoon. I'm very happy to welcome you and it is my pleasure to be here with you on behalf of the uh, Ministry of Environmental Protection and Agricultural Georgia and specifically uh, Environmental Information and Education Center. Of course, it is honor to represent the country that um, hosted the first uh, intergovernmental uh, conference uh, on environmental education. We are very uh, proud of it, of course, and we try to follow and to uh, implement the projects and activities uh, in order to support environmental education in the country and, of course, uh, to contribute to the environmental education development uh, um, at the international level, of course. Uh, as uh, for our center, you, uh, you mentioned the name very correctly, Environmental Information and Education Center, of course, according to its name, um, supports environmental education. One of the goal of our um, center is uh, to, and main function is to support informal and non-formal environmental education and also to contribute to, uh, formal in environmental education and initiate uh, some uh, uh, programs and ideas and of course we cooperate very closely together with the Ministry of Education and um, uh, Science of Georgia. Uh, as well, as, uh, I, it is uh, my pleasure to share some national experience with you today. Uh, if uh, we talk about the activities carried out by um, our center, it's uh, uh, various target audiences. So we work with uh, different uh, sectors and different uh, age categories as well. And we surely will mention students and teachers, of course, especially. I would like to underline the um, uh, educators, uh, particularly, for example, preschool um, uh, uh, teachers and um, uh, general uh, school public school teachers. I would like to mention one program which is called the uh, uh, preschool environmental educational program and I'm uh, very uh, happy to say that uh, we uh, managed to uh, launch this program and introduce environmental principles at uh, um, kindergarten level. Uh, we um, managed to train uh, at least uh, one teacher from each uh, kindergarten at the national level. They are trained and have ability to integrate environmental components in teaching process during the trainings, the educators, and uh, we are provided with a special guidebook that were uh, also elaborated with our center, of course, uh, and uh, it includes the three uh, key topics which might be like easily adaptable to teach at um, uh, that uh, level, biodiversity, uh, water, energy, energy conservation, waste management, uh, and water resources. Uh, most of the kindergartens in Georgia now have already integrated the program, and we can see the results um, uh, from uh, that program in the contest, which we organize annually uh, for kindergartens, uh, and it is called Green Award. Um, also, in addition to that program, I would like to mention our current ongoing uh, reform on environmental education. It is called Environmental and Agricultural Education in School. Uh, and this is a logical uh, development and continuation of the previous program. We have elaborated the special set of textbooks um, uh, with uh, eight different uh, topics. And uh, it is developed for particularly for primary school teachers and includes uh, important topics of both environment and agriculture. Uh, and they're easily adaptable for primary schools from one to six grade uh, classes. 
Uh, it's an extra material for the teacher uh, supporting formal and informal education activities. The topics are divided into eight independent books, as I mentioned. And for example, it includes the topics such as uh, sustainable development, biodiversity conservation, uh, water resource management, air quality, climate change, um, uh, waste management and land management, agriculture and food safety too. So um, now we are going to introduce this uh, uh, set of uh, textbooks uh, into the schools. We have already started training uh, uh, of teachers uh, at national wide. And uh, for example, even today, the trainings for the teachers are uh, going on and we are waiting for the first phase uh, feedback from the uh, teachers. Uh, in addition to the training of teachers in order to introduce the uh, uh, program at schools and uh, to have not uh, one-time trainings, just the um we are going to have uh, asynchronous training modules also and we're working to uh develop um, the um, training online training models for teachers to uh have opportunity to see the um uh, courses whenever they uh, would like of course uh, to do Considering the national interest in the uh, environmental protection and priority of uh, uh, environmental uh, issues, of course, uh, one of the target group for us is the uh, private sector and, of course, uh, development of green jobs and supporting green businesses uh, among the priorities of the uh, country. Uh, so uh, one of the beneficiaries for us and stakeholders is the private sector. We conduct the environmental manager uh, courses. It's an educational course uh, which provides private companies an opportunity to have a qualified and retrained environmental specialist, specifically specialized um, in that case for waste management. Uh, and uh, it, uh, of course, supports enforcement of the law um, in the field of environment and in the field of waste management itself, and also supports the uh, private companies and business sector to have the environmental qualified and trained environmental specialists. Following the main mission of our center, raising awareness about environmental democracy and its uh, fundamentals is uh, one of the most uh, basic priorities, of course. And we um, conduct and elaborated the training campaign um, with the name Human Rights uh, uh, and Responsibilities, Environmental Democracy. The target audience for this uh, um, campaign was municipalities, local municipality authorities, local uh, NGOs and civil society and local media from all over the regions of the country. And we had the opportunity to manage and uh, implement the campaign um, uh, throughout the country. So uh, it was um, beneficial to support uh, in that case to support uh, um, implementation of the UNEC Aarhus Convention and also to train the you know, local people in rural areas uh, on environmental issues, on their environmental rights and responsibilities. Uh, besides the uh, trainings on uh, environmental democracy, for, uh, we should uh, also emphasize the uh, importance of strengthening skills and knowledge of municipal representatives and um, uh, government authorities at the uh, local level uh, in the regions of the country. So it was one of the reasons why we conducted this training and we have also many different other activities specifically to improve uh, the skills and to improve green skills, of course, uh, especially uh, at all level in the country, uh, at national level in general. Uh, I would like also to mention the effective communication with media uh, is uh, one of our high priority, of course, and we always try to have um, seminars or different activities for media representatives, uh, both at national level and at local level as well. Um, in okay. addition, okay, that, so these that... are just the key ones, and uh, of course, we have many different um, uh, actors and stakeholders uh, that we try to have different campaigns uh, based on the necessity and, of course, based on the gaps that it needed to be filled in. Thank you very much. You know, it's difficult to stop you because you say all these interesting things, but what I think what Tamar let us understood from all these different kinds of activities that you are doing that it is really a whole of society approach and we have to be implemented developing skill competencies and developing mindsets of different actors. 
There are two questions that we would like to take from the chat. I don't know how many there are. Yeah, there are more, more. There are many more, but more, many uh, more. But uh, let, let's um, give quick answers. Yes. So. Yes. So, question number one from Alistair: Are upskilling and reskilling programs enough to prevent people ending up in long-term unemployment and inactivity? What other instruments do we need to put in place? Okay, but this is a very long question. I know, so, I know. Like, I, according to what you three speakers now. From what you know from your countries, from your researches, uh, are there enough uh, retraining programs for people who need to pass through this training effort? Yes or no? <laughs> Never <laughs> enough to retrain. It's regular process, continuous one. And I think we should always uh, uh, keep in mind to know the exact gaps and to follow the needs to retrain again and to uh, up support update our skills, of course, to be in line with modern technologies, of course. Of course, it's never enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, then there is a comment from uh, Fabio uh, that policy fragmentation is indeed the norm in the digitalization field, even if some holistic national policies in Europe do exist, such as one of Ireland. So just giving an example. And then there is a very good question actually coming again, again from Alistair. Ideally, people should be able to upskill and reskill before they lose their jobs. How can people access reskilling and upskilling opportunities while in employment? And how can people know about these opportunities? So that's a very good one. I don't know, maybe Nina could take it. Olga? Or, uh, yes, Nina? Olga? No, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> Olga, would you like to say two words on that? <laughs> If you want one million dollar question and two words. <laughs> um, well, I think you know the uh, the devil is really in, in coordination of different policies, um, because very often we find out that it's not only the you know, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Labor do not talk to each other about uh, skilling and in the development of uh, different parts of the workforce, basically. But it's also the Ministry of Environment or Ministry of uh, Economy, not, not really coordinating with the Ministry of Education and, and Labor. And therefore, in a wonderful policies on climate change and sustainability, for example, or digital policies, they, uh, they don't have really the respective uh, counterpart uh, on, on employment and, and skill development policies. Um, that is a worrying sign. And also, you know, if we would like to, to make sure that the transition is smooth, we need to think about financing, financing uh, which uh, has to be massive in order to ensure that the transition, the multiple transitions people go through, not only transition from school to work, but also work to work, job to job throughout their life, uh, covered, is covered uh, by adequate resources. Um, and therefore, active labor market policies is, of course, important, but it's just one element of the whole spectrum. I think we need to think bigger than just active labor market policies, but to allow access to some innovative uh, ways to finance where people are put at the center. When, uh, when training provision is not um, linked only to the type of the employment contract, for example, but when everybody can get access to funding, either through um, individual, uh, some type of individual training fund or um, voucher system on something else that might, might be uh, really uh, in the interest of, uh, of individuals. And also, you know, whether it's enough or not, the question, uh, it's never enough, definitely. And especially with the size of the, of the change we are facing, it's definitely not enough. And what is worrying, that as the result of the COVID-19, we see there are cuts in training budgets on the private side, as well as the public side, uh, where you know, there, there are scarcity in resources. The first item in the budget, uh, in the budget, the first line to cut is extra training budget, which is, which shouldn't be happening, not in the situation we are facing now. Um, so, yeah. Never enough. And I think we need, we need to combine not like active labor market policies with uh, you know, budgets that come from the private side as well as the public side with um, also ensuring the income subsistence during the time of, uh, of training. That's another important, important element. Okay. 
There is one more comment. Yes. Uh, 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 sorry, Tatiana wants to say something. Okay, sure. But yeah, yes. Yes, if, if I may, because Olga indeed uh, answered the question in, in depth, but uh, maybe one of the recommendations are in uh, the new opinion on adult learning, uh, where the, our committee suggests uh, the Commission and the member states set achievable long term goals and establish a continuous monitoring monitoring system of uh, adult learning participation, in this case, maybe also workers' participation in high quality and accessible lifelong learning, including employee training for each member state and uh, also taking into consideration regional differences. And we're uh, speaking not about monitoring this particular, let's say, uh, employee in the sector skills, but the system should aim uh, to ensure that everyone has the knowledge, skills, competences, and attitude needed for Europe to establish a just cohesive, sustainable, digital, and well society. In other way, the, they need to prepare the system, should be there to prepare everyone to be ready at any moment uh, to uh, take any a role or position, etc. So this is completely different, different paradigm of, of existing education and training system. And unfortunately, we have to, to see that uh, how to improve research and skills intelligence at sectoral and national levels and skills needs and skills forecasts. This is this is uh, uh, still not enough. Even CDFOP is doing a lot, of course. This is something I would should, should add for what Olga already said. Financing, that's of course. Thank you, Tatiana. Yeah, of course. <laughs> that's obvious. <laughs> Uh, I would like to comment, but I will not because I will leave the place to the uh, to the comment we have. Yes, from uh, there is a, a last comment from Roman saying that hypothetically a coal plant that will soon close will not have incentives to retrain its employees. Governments must step in. So it's about the roles of who is doing what in this green transition. So I think this is a good comment to to close this uh, session. We will talk about it in the next uh, uh, session, but uh, certainly this aspect of just transition, I mean, these regions and people and communities who will suffer through the implementation of these greening policies, uh, who have to be supported uh, uh, to develop skills, but not only, it is to develop new opportunities, new economic uh, sustainable opportunities. So I would like to thank, it's never enough the time, I would like to thank our speakers for their contributions. And uh, I, now I would invite for a little, a small break, a small break of five minutes before we pass our next panel. Okay, so please be back in, now it is uh, uh, in five minutes, yes. you're 13. 13. 13, we are back. The green and digital transition is reshaping our world beyond imagination. The environmental impact of the way we live today has made the green revolution not only desirable, but inevitable. New digital technologies are redesigning the world around us and changing the way we interact with each other. Together, they are transforming the way we live and the way we work changing the types of jobs we do and the skills we need to do them at a pace we have never experienced before. To adapt to these changes, we will all need to develop new skill sets and new mindsets. This means rethinking what we teach and how we teach it. Greening will require all of us to be environmentally aware and to apply environmentally friendly principles at work and in our daily lives. If we want people to be the masters of technology rather than its servants, everyone will need digital awareness and digital literacy. More of us will need the skills to design, build and operate complex technological systems applied to different areas of human activity. This means new content in education and training embedding digital skills and environmental awareness as core competencies across the curriculum. 
updating and developing new curricula for new professions created by the digital and green transition, making learning readily accessible, valued and recognized everywhere. It means attracting more people into science and technology. It also means a new focus on soft skills. As routine tasks are taken over by machines, jobs will call increasingly on the uniquely human capabilities of creativity, communication, collaborative working and complex problem solving. New digitally enabled ways of working will put innovation and entrepreneurship at a premium. Education and training must be at the heart of this transformation, providing citizens of all ages with the tools, the vision and values to fulfill their own potential. There are many examples of good practice to inspire us, but we need to act together and we need to act now so that we can start building today the inclusive, lifelong learning systems to shape our green and digital future. If we can imagine it, we can build it. The green and digital transition is reshaping our world beyond imagination. The environmental impact of the way we live today has made the green revolution not only desirable, but inevitable. New digital technologies are redesigning the world around us and changing the way we interact with each other. Together, they are transforming the way we live and the way we work changing the types of jobs we do and the skills we need to do them at a pace we have never experienced before. To adapt to these changes, we will all need to develop new skill sets and new mindsets. This means rethinking what we teach and how we teach it. Greening will require all of us to be environmentally aware and to apply environmentally friendly principles at work and in our daily lives. If we want people to be the masters of technology rather than its servants, everyone will need digital awareness and digital literacy. More of us will need the skills to design, build and operate complex technological systems applied to different areas of human activity. This means new content in education and training embedding digital skills and environmental awareness as core competencies across the curriculum. Updating and developing new curricula for new professions created by the digital and green transition, making learning readily accessible, valued and recognized everywhere. It means attracting more people into science and technology. It also means a new focus on soft skills as routine tasks are taken over by machines, jobs will call increasingly on the uniquely human capabilities of creativity, communication, collaborative working and complex problem solving. New digitally enabled ways of working will put innovation and entrepreneurship at a premium. Education and training must be at the heart of this transformation, providing citizens of all ages with the tools, the vision and values to fulfill their own potential. There are many examples of good practice to inspire us, but we need to act together and we need to act now so that we can start building today the inclusive, lifelong learning systems to shape our green and digital future. If we can imagine it, we can build it. Okay, I hope we are all back. Yes, we are ready to start again. So please switch on your camera just to show us that you are back and ready for the next um, session. Before we start, uh, and uh, while um, waiting uh, 
all of you uh, coming back, uh, we would like to hear from you. As we said at the beginning, uh, um, your opinion is really important for us. So we give a second try to uh, our Mentimeter, Paul. So thanks, Maria, for uh, the link in the chat. Please open it and uh, let us know your, um, your reply. What are the essential skills for you? Um, now we put also a bit of a challenge in the replying to this uh, question. First of all, you will have only one maximum of two words to reply. And also green skills is not an option of reply. So be creative, tell us uh, your, your view. I see that um, some uh, replies are coming. Creativity seems to be the most essential skill so far. Soft skills as well. Adaptability, critical thinking. Other results are coming. Unlearn linear economy, transversal skills, soft skills. And they see that the creativity, critical thinking, and adaptability are the most uh, essentials for you. It's really interesting uh, indeed uh, as, a, as a result. So thank you very much for your opinion on this. And now I'm happy to pass the floor back to Anastasia to start the second uh, session. Anastasia, well, well, I, I will start the second session by saying Please. that I partially agree with the results of the Mentimeter. Why be partially? Be because the soft skills are not, they are necessary, they are not sufficient. People have to have the technical skills to be able to apply Absolutely. new technologies. Technological development is important. And although it shapes, you know, the way the workplace are organized, it also creates needs for people to know about these technologies and be able to apply. So I would disagree. <laughs> no, I'm not disagree. I just want to say it's just a partial answer to the fact that we also need technical skills, skills to be able to apply these new technologies in workplaces and in, uh, in uh, you know, any economic activity. <laughs> Parenthesis closed. <laughs> uh, now what we will do, it is to pass to our next panel, who, uh, which will try to answer a question, how can we reinforce lifelong learning to support skilling requirements and empower exactly this green and digital transition? So it is about how we go about creating and reinforcing lifelong learning. Yeah, we discussed a little bit before on some actions that are taking place. We said active labor market measures are not enough. We have to see it in a broader perspective. Uh, so let's see what we can do. And our panelists are coming from three different uh, domains. Yeah, uh, we have uh, uh, Miss Ina Kozitska, vice rector for academic affairs of Academy DTEC in Ukraine. We have Ms. Charlotte Bisberg, Chief of Education, Competence and Culture in the region of North Denmark. And we have Chiara Riondino. Yes, we have her, she just is reconnecting. Okay. But she's there. <laughs> okay, we will have Chiara Riondino, head of unit in DG Employment, Head of Unit for Vet Apprenticeships and Adult Learning. And uh, I would like now to pass immediately to the question to, um, to Ina. Uh, Ina, uh, just for, for our participants, DTEC is, a, is, a big, is the biggest private provider of energy in Ukraine. DTEC employs 70,000 people in the country, yeah? and uh, created the Academy DTEC, hmm? which is also, as I understand, the bigger training provider in the country. So my question to you, Ina, is the following one. Why? Why DTEC decided to establish an academy rather, rather than, uh, I don't know, relying on public or private uh, training providers? Yeah. And if you can also explain us a little bit what is the scope of, uh, of the Academy for our participants to follow. The floor to you. Good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Um, thank you for your introduction, Anastasia. And uh, to answer your questions, I would like to tell a little more about uh, a, a DTEC group. 
Uh, DTEC is Ukrainian's largest energy group with assets uh, in coal mining, electricity generation and distribution, alternative energy, ener uh, energy and gas production. Uh, to support our business in changes of professional environment, Academy Detect started 10 years ago as internal educational platform for Detect employees talent development. Uh, during all these years, the Academy has transformed, changed the content of educational programs and approaches. And now, today, Academy Detect is an open educational platform that built the educational ecosystem in Ukraine, shares experience and provides high quality, innovative knowledge, not only to the company's employees, but also to business partners, society and the government. Uh, and uh, the Academy has more than 300 internal experts who share the, this experience based on detect practice. And as you say, Anastasia, one of our biggest adventures is more than 70,000 uh, 70, employees. So uh, it means we have a really huge database to analyze and to look for new and innovative solutions in education to support our business and not only our in business in Ukraine, yes, because we are open a plat educational platform now. Uh, so when, uh, um, uh, when I answer to your questions, why did I create an academy rather than relying on public or other private training providers? We think about this and I can say that unfortunately formal education, uh, formal, formal educational organization and other public private training providers uh, are not able to provide us with specific, specific programs for workers and management, especially when it comes about achievements in green and digital field. Uh, because we have really, I think, a lot of innovation programs in our educational, pro uh, in our educational uh, programs. So what exactly our scope of the work of academy. Uh, we outline the main programs uh, to help our employees be more flexible. Uh, that's why I wrote now about flexible and ad adaptable. Um, innovative and able to manage the ch uh, challenges of uh, modern world. world. Regularly, we provide training and workshops for them and long-term programs for managers and top managers. And currently we are developing an individual um, learning journey to help in mastering the needed relevant knowledge in more efficient way. And I want to say some information about uh, how much uh, trainings and how much activities we have in our academy. For example, uh, we have, um, 40,000 DTEC employees annually trained, 40,000, yes. And then we have, um, for example, more than, uh, than uh, 1,000 professional programs. And uh, I want um, um, to tell a, a little, um, I want to tell uh, next uh, about our professional standards, but now I uh, want to say about professional programs. It and it more than one thousand. It's really a big work for us. And uh, then we have uh, uh, almost uh, two hundred programs for target courses. Target courses. It's hard skill and soft skills, but it's a targeted. In, uh, different, in our different businesses. So it's uh, very customized for us. Uh, we have uh, more than uh, 50,000 test items for our workers and for our management. And uh, what else? I think that uh, most important thing for us is why 
we created cooperative instit, uh, uh, university. It's about um, it's, that's why we have this this expertise and we can do it uh, cust customized for our workers in management. And then we and then we started to be a really open and pl uh, educational platform in Ukraine. Can I tell you just to, want to ask one thing that came into my mind? Who pays for the delivery of these programs? Is it DTEC that pays for the delivery, or you have resources also from? Yeah. So it's uh, you mean in educational way? Yes, about yeah. program. Uh, so we have more than uh, three hundred internal experts that delivers these programs. That's why we have and, and not only trainers, we have researchers that um, um, got this database and analyze this database to improve our programs. Okay, thank you very much. Now we will pass uh, to, to Denmark. So, uh, Charlotte, um, well, the region of North, of North Denmark, I, I was told, I didn't know, is also called the top of the continent. Yeah. In fact, I will come there for holidays this year. It's decided. Come. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, and, uh, and this region, it has experienced a lot of economic restructuring during the last years. Yeah. Uh, it, it used to have a, a high level of low qualified people. And you have changed that in the meantime. It's uh, uh, the economy of the region is uh, primarily based on small and medium enterprises. The population and demography is changing, but it is also a very um, um, ambitious, as I understand, region, because you have a, a 2023 uh, development strategy for the region, uh, working towards SDGs explicitly caring for the environment, tapping on new digital technologies and putting skills and lifelong learning as a key pillar of the implementation of this strategy. So my question would be to you, it would be, how do you make lifelong learning work for people and companies in your region? Thank you, Anastasia, for your introduction, and thank you for letting me participate. I'll try to uh, uh, roll out what we, how we work with lifelong learning. Um, it all starts with the development plan, as you described. Uh, we have uh, made it in, in cooperation with all our municipalities, which is 11, and it's called as a subheading Developing North Denmark Together. And that is important because these goals are ambitious and they are descri described along with the municipalities, along with business organizations, along with uh, education in institutions. So they all have, uh, we all have shared and ambitious goals in, according to lifelong learning. It's a, a great strength and it's our uh, uh, ground for, for further development. This development plan has different kind of actions, and one of them is called uh, the Technology Pact North. Uh, and this Technology Pact North is also a broad uh, partnership which includes educational institutions and municipalities and all kinds of uh, people uh, which, is, uh, which take part in this process. And here we have um, uh, decided uh, that uh, we have a special task and they have a special task in uh, achieving STEM competences for all our uh, population. STEM is what we call a shortcut for science, technology, engineering and mathematics. So that, that partnership has this special task. And they uh, have now decided to make an analysis which is called uh, Framcom 4. And it's an analysis which we have done uh, three times before. And this is the fourth time. And uh, Framcom stands for Future Competences. And it's a, a, an analysis where we try to uh, investigate uh, and uh, try to describe all the needs according to digital and green uh, change. We, ha we have... Um, uh, here, it's a broad partnership as well. We have education institutions, business partners, 
labor market organizations, we all sit around a large table and we discuss and we try to elaborate how uh, uh, to, to find out how these competences are shown. In, um, we, we try to see how is STEM skills, what STEM skills are required in management and staff level, what are the needs for green skills, how are they showing differently in, in sectors and in different kinds of educations, what are the need for digital skills and how are they shown. And this is an example for a unique collaboration which represents all of our partners and we give uh, this uh, analysis gives uh, a shared picture of what challenges are we going to uh, to try to uh, work with and what are the goals, what competences do we need. And uh, all the partners are, uh, can you see, participate in this and they participate in investigating, in uh, joining, discussing uh, how do these uh, competences, uh, how do how do they show and what actions are needed? Um, that is one thing which is uh, uh, relevant for lifelong learning, shared goals and a partnership which can contribute to, to this. But that is not enough. If uh, we have in Denmark, we have a, a, a good legislations, a very unique system because we were, uh, uh, where the nation, nation subside, subside uh, uh, education. We, and we still have a group with very poor educations and very poor ability to learn. And therefore, all the nation, we have national structures which secures these. They get a subsidiary while they uh, part, uh, participate in the education and uh, we uh, the courses are for free and can be taken in connection with work and um, the legislations uh, are very strongly because we have to offer education all over the country with a maximum transport time for the preparatory adult education of 50 minutes and we have as a region and then the ministry has to look look after if that is succeeded. So, so for the very weakest of our uh, workforce, we have very good um, subsidiary and we have good education to provide. So now we have the shared goals, we have uh, a, a partnership which uh, work with it, we have support for the weakest and a good education system to provide uh, lifelong learning. And uh, the third thing I will uh, uh, I'll say it's uh, development oriented and development accustomed schools, which adjust their teaching, their curricula, your, their didactics on an ongoing basis, which leads to agility and ownership for the development. If we have to make lifelong learning uh, succeed with green skills, digital skills, STEM skills, in new way, it demands new ways of teaching. So we have to have these education sc and schools um, to to uh, develop new ways of of uh, of learning, Pro more problem based, more value based learning, more experimental learning, and more uh, experiments with digitals, uh, as you said, Anastasia. I'm so I do so agree. We have to uh, be able to use the the digitals tools in all our educations. So we have a broad partnership which take takes uh, part in uh, setting goals and uh, joining in for, for actives. We have a national security system and education, and we have schools which take part and develop their, their didactics along the way. Well, sir, thank you very much. Uh, I think you have been quite comprehensive uh, on, uh, on the way it works. Uh, working at regional level, but also in building the national regional level interaction to deliver lifelong learning. So up to now, what we have done it is to see two cases, one from a private company that develops uh, its own academy to develop skills. We have seen the regional dimension, and now we pass to another dimension, and this is the European dimension. So I would like to ask uh, Chiara, 
um, about the EU policies, because last year, despite the COVID, despite all the problems that COVID brought us, it was an extremely productive year for the European Union uh, to shape its future uh, skills agenda and VET agenda. So we have now a new skills agenda for sustainable competitiveness, social fairness and resilience. We have the Osnabrück Declaration for Vocational Education and Training. And what we would like from you, if you agree, of course, it is to tell us what are these strategic directions? Yeah, What are these European policies that we are having? What are their strategic directions and priorities to support the green and digital transition? To you. Thank you very much, Anastasia. Yes, it was a very productive year and uh, we put a lot of things on the table and now we need to implement them uh, together uh, with our partners uh, like ETF and SEDEFOB, especially the member states that of course are the ones who bring them the, the, the action uh, in, in the countries and to the ground. Uh, and we have very many things that we are working on. So I, I will just mention, mention a few. Uh, so uh, of course, skills agenda, Osterbrook declaration, council recommendation of vocational education and training. These are our three policy documents that really shape uh, our work and, and as I said the work also in cooperation uh, with, with all the relevant uh, stakeholders and in all of these uh, three priority three policy documents the, the green transition is extremely important and we, of course we tackle it from from different uh, from different angles but so if we look at the skills agenda first uh, this is of course uh, looking at uh, uh, helping people people of working age to uh, respond and adapt to, to the needs of the labor market, which of course is changing towards a, a greener uh, uh, approach. And, and we have seen, unfortunately, also in this, in this last uh, uh, days, so really the alarming reports that come from the scientific world. Uh, as you have already discussed in the previous panel, of course, the transition uh, will not uh, be driven by itself. We need to accompany it. We need to help uh, people uh, take uh, the opportunities of the transition and, and, and not to suffer from unfair uh, and unjust transition. So we have a number of actions. We have, for example, the Pact for Skills that brings together industry, uh, social partners, uh, um, and uh, education and training providers, local authorities, uh, national authorities to really mobilize entire ecosystems uh, in providing uh, workers the skills they need for the transition in specific sectors, but also companies, the talents they need to prosper. Uh, we then have a number of other actions specific for the green transition. We are working on a taxonomy uh, uh, for of skills for the labor market. Uh, we are also, uh, as it was also mentioned, as a commission, we are working on a, a proposal for a council recommendation on uh, education for sustainability that will go across all education and training sectors and this is of course is looking at a lifelong learning perspective so from the from the cradle to the grave because we need to prepare the mindsets and not only look at the specific needs now of the labor market which are of course important but also prepare a new generation of conscious uh, uh, citizens. Uh, and then we are implementing the recommendation and the declaration. There is a specific objective in the, in the Osnabrück declaration on the green transition. Uh, so we are working with, with member states uh, and stakeholders on that. We are setting up a dedicated working group uh, with the council under the, uh, let's say, umbrella of the European education area in VET that will uh, look uh, uh, very much at the green transition. We are having constant um, discussions with the, with the VET providers to identify good practices that can be uh, shared. Uh, and of course, uh, there is the uh, very uh, important uh, uh, mainstreaming of, of the green elements in all of our uh, working priorities. Uh, for example, we are working on identifying core profiles uh, in VET to understand what are the 
common um, uh, skills and competencies needed under the different profiles and the green element of, of every profession, new and old, will of course be very, uh, very important. So we are doing a lot of things. I cannot go in, in many, in much more detail, but of course happy to also continue uh, further in the discussion to, uh, to give more elements. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I think uh, there is a quite breadth of actions to, <laughs> to be mentioned. Now, I would like uh, to go back uh, to Ina. Uh, I don't see her, I think. She is. She is. Yeah, yeah. so Ina. Yeah. Uh, yes, there you are, because <laughs> normally I would, I would expect to see you in, <laughs> in our group. Um, now, uh, you work in the sector of energy, yeah? and, and, and this is a sector that is changing dramatically, really, with uh, the uh, green transition, but not only, because all the technological innovation that is taking place and uh, uh, changes that sector itself, um, in particular towards renewable energy sources. Um, now, this, this uh, transformation of the sector would obviously have some impact on local communities people who have been working for a long time in the coal areas, for example, being engaged there. And, and now they have to change, yeah, as the sector is changing. So I would like to ask you, uh, how do you work with the local communities uh, to support them in this change process in terms you know, of adaptation of their own uh, uh, skills and capacities? Thank you very much uh, for the questions. Uh, I can tell about our big impact for this field. Uh, the Academy closely cooperates with the Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine and developing, updating, implementing of state professional and educational standards, uh, which take into account knowledge in renewable energy source and other techno technological innovations. And these uh, standards, professional, new st professional standards are relevant not only for the task of detect business group, but also for all local communities in Ukraine. Uh, as for now, our experts uh, developed uh, uh, 47 new professional standards um, is for blue collar workers and ad additional some uh, standards with other companies in Ukraine, uh, but uh, I think 30, 30 uh, professional standards were developed for our own, with our own from our own professional and experts. So um, all of them were approved by the Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine and currently used in education, educating students in state institutions, not in private or cooperative institutions or universities, but in state institutions. And uh, also being as uh, a social resp resp responsible company, Academy delivers training also to 28 state institutions, for example, National Bank of Ukraine, Ministry of Finance, uh, State Post Office, Min Ministry of Energy and Coal Industry, etc. And uh, as for now, around uh, uh, more, more uh, 3,000 officials were trained in different projects, upskill uh, for new uh, challenges, for new skills uh, in our academy. Oh, I cannot hear. Uh, uh, okay. No, what uh, what I, I, I remark it is in fact uh, uh, you are you are much more integrated in the uh, uh, skills ecosystem, mm -hmm. also in relation to uh, national uh, um, national standards. Yeah. So the standards that you develop can be used by anybody afterwards. Yeah, yes, in Ukraine, I want to add that in Ukraine, some professional standards were set around, can you imagine, around 70 years ago, were set 70 years ago, and now we have, we had such opportunity to change this, and it's amazing for us, and I think it's a really big challenge and big um, impact for our society. 
And of course, this has been to be done very quickly because yesterday exactly we had a discussion. There was a training provider telling us, today I teach my kids to learn how to be plumbers, yeah? Mm -hmm. Or, and I know when they go out in the labor market, all this is history. Yes. The whole way of how to do this profession has changed completely. But me as a training provider, I cannot move fast because what I lack it is exactly the standards of the new ways of delivering yes. this profession that can teach them for. So you are doing that fast, yes. I yes. And to, we continue to work with the standard, standards and think it will be more uh, opportunities to do it faster because it's not easy uh, in, uh, in changing work, but we try to do it as fast as possible in this situation. Okay, thank you very much for this, Ina. Um, I would go back uh, to Charlotte because uh, you talked a lot about partnership, Charlotte, mm -hmm. before. Um, common vision, yes, but partnership was, I think, the main element of, your, uh, of what you told us. Now, we discuss a lot about partnerships, and not now, we have been discussing for years. But partnerships do not always work. And sometimes they're even painful. You know, they, they, they can even block processes rather than moving mm -hmm. ahead. <laughs> yeah. So how, how do you do it? You know, how, why in this case of North Denmark partnership functions? You've got a point, uh, Anastasia, uh, but in, in the regions in Denmark, we are pushed to find ways. We do not have any formal powers or authority in regards to lifelong learning. So we call, instead we call it soft power, which basically means that we try to get support, ensure ownership and a shared direction through carefully selected strategic cooperation with relevant players. We try hard to secure that the strategy is coherent to a stakeholder's interest. So uh, this demands and uh, a lot of discussions and negotiations in the partnerships and a focus on higher goals. We have come to the conclusion that not one of us are able to solve the problems. We have to work together, but that is not enough. Um, we have to have focus on that every stakeholder should have some benefits of the cooperation and be able to integrate decision into their own organization. And they have to have benefits, which can be access to data. It can be the opportunity of co-deciding the, the, the common or the shared goals that is power and the opportunity of taking their own interest into the political area and that is a partnership which also creates power so in Framcom which was uh, the partnership I mentioned before about the future competences there is a st steering group and an expert group and they are involved throughout the process they are involved in the strategic decisions and the following actions and to implement the results afterwards so, so when they're in, involved in decision making and, and providing the data, they are also more motivated at, by taking these results to their own organizations and do the, the necessary actions. So we try to, it demands a lot of coffee and it, it demands a lot of meetings and very much dialogue how to uh, uh, drive and uh, facilitate and turn and in, try to have all perspectives inside the process. So, but when we have this, this we have a motivated, motivated vet institutions, motivated labor, organiz labor organizations, municipalities, which afterwards take these problems and do something about it in their own organization. So we, we managed to make it like ownership, shared ownership to problems and to actions. And that is very good, good for us because we, we don't have much power. We just can provide coffee and a round table. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way of putting it really. Yeah. So they have the power, the partners yeah. have the power. Yeah. And they yeah. recognize that they have the power to work together, to yeah. influence one another and then be able to implement. Yeah. And with the, share, uh, the good intention of higher goals, what are the goals for, whole, for the whole of Northern Jutland? That is, that is also, it's always the key point, not for each of us, but what, is, what, is, what are 
what is what is the common goal for all of us that we all can buy into and there we can see we we have to relate on each other because we can't do it ourselves thank you i it's think it's not this... always good but we try <laughs> yeah well of course uh, okay and then and then just the last uh, question to to chiara uh, you started mentioning before some actions yeah, that are being put in place uh, by the European Commission uh, to bring forward the, the new skills agenda. And, um, and uh, I would like to ask you a little bit more information on that because I think our participants would be interested to know a little bit more about this, uh, these uh, actions. Thank you, Anastasia. As, as I say, we're doing many, many things. So maybe I will try to structure also a bit the intervention mentioning three levels. So you may know that to support this moment of recovery and also to take the opportunity to move uh, uh, towards the digital and green transition, the European Union has uh, adopted a massive plan, I would say a martial plan uh, of investments uh, to support investments and reform, which is the recovery and resilience facility. So there is a lot of money that is available for investment in reforms. And of course, this is also a company and matched by uh, our usual structural funds, the European Social Fund, the European Fund for Regional Development, which also can support this kind of reform. So this is a first layer in how we help uh, the member states uh, um, face these challenges, because we should never forget that the competence for education and training is with the member states, sometimes at regional level even. So of course we need cooperation. We have these strategic directions that you have mentioned and these policy objectives, but we also have to help the member states and the stakeholders with the tools. So there is a lot of funding available. There is also Erasmus Plus, our, let's say, more operational way of, of working also with stakeholders. Then we are preparing additional, because, okay, we don't stop here. Even if we have a lot of things uh, already on the table, we are preparing additional proposals uh, that will also empower individuals to continue to learn throughout their lives. And so we will come, uh, out with two proposals for council recommendations by the end of the year, one on individual learning accounts and one on micro-credentials. And we believe that these are really tools that will empower people to uh, one, take control of their own learning with the individual learning account, and two, to benefit from really targeted and flexible tools to update quickly and in a targeted way their competencies through the micro-credentials. And then one, uh, I would say, final uh, in a, in a concrete initiative that I would like to mention, which is a, a, of a different nature, uh, it's the Centers of Vocational Excellence. And you know that we share also this priority with, uh, with ETF. And this is something that also is very important, uh, I'm sure, for, for partner countries. So we really are uh, uh, supporting the development of the Centers of Vocational Excellence. Uh, and many of them are uh, really focusing uh, already on the green transition, but most of all, they are uh, really uh, key drivers for innovation. And, and one thing, and I, and I stop here, is that we have to keep in mind that green is not in isolation. And uh, we often talk about green skills. I'm sure somebody already said this before me, but there are, there are no such things as green skills. It, it's, it's the innovation, doing things differently, doing things smartly, combining transversal skills with very specific skills, with more general, let's say, uh, STEM skills. Uh, so uh, we believe that the Centers of Vocational Excellence can uh, give this function of bringing together the different actors on the territory, embedded in the fabric of the territory, but also linking in international networks to really push this innovation forward. So uh, maybe this not to be exhaustive because I think the whole commission is really working on green priorities now, uh, but just to, to give you a few elements of how we tackle this from different points of view, the funding, the policy instruments and concrete initiatives. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, it was really very clear, the different levels of, uh, um, of supporting uh, this uh, skills development during the green transition. One thing that I would like to highlight is extremely important also, uh, uh, that was also mentioned in the previous sessions uh, that we had this week, uh, it, this international cooperation among training providers. So this is the very important thing you mentioned about the centers of vocational excellence. So uh, I think that in the future, training providers will have a, a much more important role to play as innovators in skills development processes. And this uh, international cooperation and interaction uh, is important also for our uh, partner countries. Uh, so we, we hope a lot on this uh, exchange. And it is not only, of course, for training providers. You can see international cooperation at different levels. But uh, um, um, I mean, this, uh, these platforms of exchange, uh, of sharing, of, uh, of exchanging experience, we all learn. We all learn. So uh, I, I think it is also another instrument for uh, the European Commission. And Erasmus Plus, certainly, it is an instrument that supports, obviously, this uh, cooperation. OK. Now, um, are there any questions? I think they are all exhausted by now. <laughs> we, we are all exhausted by now. But I think we did cover all the different aspects of the, of the uh, life, developing lifelong learning systems. What I would like to do it is to ask my colleague Ivona, who opened this session, to uh, just uh, share your reflections about uh, you know, how did we bring the discussion forward uh, since we started, yeah? We started two hours ago with some ideas, challenges, exchange, and then we had another panel too, and we, we came up with a lot of possible solutions. So could you? Well, yes, yes, indeed. Thank you, Anastasia, for giving me the floor. Uh, well, what I noted as a last point is that uh, in order to, uh, uh, really build a lifelong learning system in partnerships we would need a lot of coffee and a round table so this is my <laughs> this is my takeaway uh, but obviously uh, there are a number of uh, elements and uh, also uh, Chiara explained from the policy level and I think that the, one of the uh, key takeaway for me uh, for example is that we really need to act at the policy level so at the policy level that then is uh, going towards uh, other levels, uh, towards uh, regional level, from national level and to local level. Very, uh, really interesting element that also um, Charlotte mentioned is about uh, local level uh, politics uh, that needs to understand. Uh, we, I was mentioning, we were discussing in another session, uh, small and medium enterprises. Yes, they need to understand their skills needs and also involvement in lifelong learning. But uh, I found a very, uh, really uh, important point also to work at the level of uh, municipalities. Uh, local level in uh, skills development, because this is where uh, things are happening. Uh, then there are also uh, a lot of elements like how to bring the green transition, that it needs to be uh, connected uh, to other policy areas uh, that the green transition, digital transition are not going in isolation. And uh, here uh, also, uh, a reflection of uh, Alistair's comment, how to do it uh, when we need to shift uh, from uh, one job to another, we are losing job. Of course, training is very much important, but also other policies are important and social policies and this social backup, also financial backup is very much uh, uh, important. So for me, those would be uh, key takeaways, but uh, maybe there are also some elements that the participants would like to emphasize as well. And maybe there is something new that we haven't discussed. Uh, but you know, we have also a drawing of this discussion. So <laughs> we will see at the drawing if there are any elements that we have missed um, from all what was discussed. Can we have the drawing? Can we share the drawing? 
Yes, I think that Caroline is ready to yes, yes, share with us uh, her graphic reporting of all the points that we have discussed today. In the meantime, you know, waiting for... Uh, Here it is. Okay. A bit of patience. Here it comes. <laughs> yeah, as we said before, we are not patient. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Okay, so this is what Caroline created is a drawing. I mean, it's really a lot of that we, we have discussed. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's really full, I would say. Uh, I mean, I can't see so far away. I don't know if you, Ivona, you can see something that the, you did not mention in your reflection to be further mentioned. Yeah. Uh, well, of course, the main uh, reflection is uh, how to make uh, lifelong learning uh, work, uh, what are the skills that we would need that uh, uh, while we were uh, discussing uh, also the elements of the green transition, what actually are the green skills, and we came to the conclusion that there are no green skills, it's uh, well, environment and aware, environmental awareness, uh, sustainability <laughs> awareness, and uh, uh, well, it, it, uh, also Chiara mentioned that the, uh, the European Commission is building a new taxonomy also to understand what are the green skills and what is the green uh, transition. Uh, well, uh, but I can see, well, uh, coffee and the round table. So <laughs> this, is, this is the point of uh, uh, reflection, uh, but also uh, elements that uh, would empower uh, people uh, to uh, really actively uh, being part of the green and digital transition. Uh, well, for example, new instruments that the European Commission is proposing on individual learning accounts, uh, micro-credentials, uh, because also in this session and in other sessions, we were discussing that uh, empowering individuals is uh, uh, really crucial, uh, that they uh, do feel uh, part of the transition, that they uh, are not isolated from uh, big uh, goals. And one of the elements that I also see uh, here is that uh, we need to uh, work together in partnerships, uh, but what is also important is that uh, uh, partnerships need to be built uh, within a common goal, that we need to uh, have this goal to uh, arrive somewhere. And also element that I uh, uh, retain uh, from the session and is also uh, here is that in order to build partnerships, uh, those that are uh, part of the partnerships, they need to have a clear benefit. So working together also means uh, having clear, clear uh, benefit of uh, uh, working together. So I think that uh, we have a lot of lots of uh, uh, elements uh, with uh, this uh, strategic approach and more, uh, in, let's say, implementation uh, mode uh, approach uh, as well. And I can see that the, the drawing is still developing. <laughs> So it's, uh, it's uh, on the go as uh, a digital and green transition because we are uh, shaping it uh, right now. Okay, thank you so much, Ivona. And uh, I think we reached the end of our time together for the moment because the discussion is to continue uh, in other settings, obviously. I would like to thank very much uh, our uh, um, speakers for uh, sharing with us all these different perspectives and experiences, and also our participants who have been patient <laughs> <laughs> to listen to us, but they are also uh, uh, developing their own ideas. So I would like to thank you again and uh, uh, wish you a good uh, continuation of your afternoon evening. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you a lot. Bye-bye.